Welcome to Spectrum Perspectives, real talk with parents, professionals, and autism advocates with your host, Cindy Gellermini. Hi, everybody. This is Cindy with another episode of Spectrum Perspectives. And today I have Dana Johnson with us. Hi, Dana. Thank you, Cindy. I'm so glad to be here. So Dana, I found her through um, the succession of the interviews that we're doing. It sort of started, if we we back all the way up, I interviewed a bunch of parents that their kids all learned how to communicate using either RPM or spelling to communicate. And then the Spellers movie came out. I went to go see that back in, I think, January or February. Um, and that led me to um, interviewing, to doing the series of interviews that we're doing now. So we interviewed Honey Rinicella and, um, and Elizabeth Vossler. And, you know, we're, we're on the succession here. So Dana, you are uh, affiliated with Spellers. So tell us a little bit... Um, before we get to what you do now, right? Because you're mm -hmm. the co-founder of the Spellers Method um, with with Don Murray, which I haven't interviewed her yet. It's coming. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's back up though, and let's talk about uh, your career and, and how it kind of evolved into where you are now. Perfect. So I always knew that I wanted to work in the autism world. Um, early on when I was actually in college, I um, volunteered and worked at a sports camp for kids and um, looked after and organized the special needs program. And many of the campers that came were autistic. And some, I, I remember this, he's a little guy, tiny guy, but he always wore this tie dye shirt. And that was purposeful so that he was easily seen, right? For obvious reasons. And it was then when I was like, this is what I really, really want to do. And so I went to um, school to become an occupational therapist and any opportunity that I got, I focused every assessment, um, every assignment, every paper on autism, as much as I could structure that because OT is such a wide range um, in terms of what we we do. So um, fast forward graduation, um, I decided, I'm actually originally from Canada, so I worked in the school system up there and then decided I am kind of over shoveling snow over and over and over. Um, I was traveling to the schools, which, you know, up there, that's kind of what, when you graduate, that's what you do. Um, you go to the schools, and so there's a lot of traveling. Um, so February, I'm like, I, this is not what I really want to do forever and ever. Um, loved what I did in the schools and working, um, and I was actually uh, working with assistive technology up there and helping to support students who had difficulty with, you know, getting accessing their academics because of motor issues. So um, moved here to the U.S. and um, opened my practice. So I've had a private clinic here in Tampa um, for 12 almost 13 years now that is the complete and... opposite of canada being in florida right. oh yeah oh it was like let's go to the you furthest. really hated the snow I did. <laughs> right actually i and i will disclose I, I moved to north carolina so it's a little bit more moderate um because i did you know i i wanted the seasons that is one thing that being in tampa um which is i know people are like wah wah right complain um, there aren't any seasons in, in, so it's, it's summer all year. Oh, that's terrible. Um, so, so I moved there first and then ended up here. I wasn't there very long. Um, and then ended up here. And so I have, I had my own practice, which is a goal that I already, I always had was to start my own practice, to be able to support not only the client or the child, um, but also their family. I've always, you know, really loved, family systems, you know, psychology, kind of figuring things out and relationships. And so, um, so I did, I, I started and really it was focused on sensory integration. And because that's in autism, what I was taught in OT school is that yes, they have difficulties with their motor skills. So fine motor, that's traditionally OT, right? It's fine motor. PT kind of works more on the, the gross motor stuff. So, um, but the, the sensory integration, so I, I really worked heavily in that SI space to support my, my clients. Um, and so then it was around 2015, I read the book, Edo in Autism Land. And that book literally changed the trajectory of my work, um, my clinic space, um, because in that book, Edo says, 
OT did nothing for me. Ooh, and I ouch. was like, right? I'm like, okay, so he is an autistic individual. This is the population that I am working with right now. And he's saying that, what does that mean? Right? Like, what did that mean? Of course he loved, you know, swinging. He loved jumping in the ball pit. He loved, you know, being on the scooter board, like a lot, of course, as a kid, I still love swinging actually at the park. Um, so it's like, okay, I get that. But what he was saying is missing, which is when I was introduced to apraxia, um, was that all these sensory things made him feel good and helped because, and, and to this day, I'm still like, yes, yeah, sensory integration is a big part of what we do. But the missing piece was fully understanding apraxia and what that actually means. And essentially, Ido said, what I'm doing in OT isn't helping me to connect my brain and my body, which mm -hmm. essentially is what apraxia is, that disconnect. And so that's the piece that I was missing. And so I literally transformed my clinic from a clinic, like a sensory integration based clinic with the ball pit, with the swings, with, you know, all those things. Now we have a treadmill, we have a, a weight rack, we have a barbell, we, you know, we do all these more functional based movements, but with weights, like to give the proprioception, which is in, you know, the, the um, input that so many of my clients need, but then working to build the connection between the brain and the body. And so we explain do, proprioception yeah. because I I had somebody else mention that also in one of the interviews yes. proprioceptive yes. and they, they didn't explain what it is. So proprioception is so we all all of us have um, receptors in our joints and our muscles that activate when we move. So it doesn't matter. Like we can I'm just moving my hands. Um, those proprioceptors are activated and then they send signals to the brain to say, this is where your hand is in space, right? Ah. My hand's up, then this is where it is in space. Now, we all have, um, you know, a sensory system that we can process, you know, efficiently. Um, my clients don't. And so then they'll do things in order to activate. So if you think about those spellers or my clients, I should say that flap, right? The flap, if you, and, and I'll have parents do this. I'm like, think about all the input that you're getting in your joints, right? And so then it's like, this is where my hand is in, or my arms are in space. This is then calming for me because right now I feel like I can't figure out where my body is in space. That's very anxiety provoking. Yes. And I've so, heard that. And I've, I've, I've heard people say that, that their kids, they don't know where their feet are, or where their hands are. They're yeah. not, not aware of where they are. Um, and that makes so much sense to me. Just thinking yeah. back on Robbie, um, he also had neuropathy, mm -hmm. but he didn't, but he didn't know his own strength. He would always slam doors. He was always slamming everything. And I was like, he's, yeah. he's not sensing something. He's not getting right. it. He's right. not getting the proper feedback yeah. that he should be getting. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And so that's what happens, right? Is that you can't grade your, your um, body, meaning he didn't know how hard he was slamming it. He couldn't grade that force, right? Yeah. And that is part of what we call the brain body disconnect. So when I have spellers that are much more, you know, forceful, so to speak, or they can't do something like for example, we do medicine ball slams, right? If we think about that, it's a physical activity. It's giving the appropriate reception because it's heavy. The ball's heavy. We're lifting it. And then, of course, those of us who've done it, the goal is to slam the ball down because it doesn't bounce. It's just like the solid weight, right? Mm -hmm. So you have someone who is like, you're like, okay, lift it and then slam. And that's like, drop. <laughs> because that movement and grading that force isn't, we don't have that motor pattern down. And so a big part of what we do is working on that brain body disconnect because all of us move, we have to move throughout the day, right? And if we're thinking about our clients, if you don't have one, the ability to know where your body is in space and two, like the connection between your intention, your idea and the action, it's gonna be so difficult for you to be productive, to do things that you want to do, to follow directions on demand. It's impossible. And so then 
those that don't understand apraxia look at what their bodies are doing and then make a judgment, right? Like they're lazy. They don't want to do this. They're just escaping to get out of it. Like we can go on and on and on and on, right? And it's this misunderstanding of apraxia. And so we here really look at how do we build the connection? Well, if we think about it, it's really, I don't want to say it's simple. It's not. It's not for someone with sensory motor differences or, motor, you know, neuromotor um, differences. It's, but the way that I talk about it with families is like, if you're teaching a child to ride a bike, you have to break it down and then you have to prompt, right? And then they practice over and over again. And then we, it's neuroplasticity, right? And then we, it's now automatic. So for most of us who learn to ride a bike early on, even if you haven't ridden a, a bike for years, you can still get on a bike and, you know, it might be a little rusty, but we can do it because we have that motor plan. So that's the goal of what we do is to build the motor plans for efficient, purposeful, intentional movement, but with control. And, and the way that we, when I say control, I'm talking about regulation, right? So um, that's the, the challenge that so many of my clients have because this is where the sensory piece comes in and all of us work this way, is that we have to process the incoming sensory information efficiently in order to have a purposeful or an intentional motor output, okay? So for example, I'm sitting in here, The light, I'm, my brain is processing the lights, you know, whatever the sounds are, I can filter them out. You know, the way that my body's sitting, I can feel my body sitting in the chair, my proprioceptors are activated, it's efficient. So now I can sit and have a conversation, which this is the motor part of what I'm doing, right? Is the speech versus someone who might be overly sensitive to auditory or to vision, right? Then that's all their brain is trying to do is to focus. And so their motor output isn't going to be efficient, intentional, or purposeful. It, again, simple, you know, description of it, but obviously our brains are extremely complex and, and we have to think about, you know, emotions in there and we have to think about memories in there, like all of the other things that are involved in how we, you know, move our bodies through space. But that's really the focus of what we want to do to support our clients, because as you, many of your, your listeners and you yourself have learned that spelling, you know, pointing letters, pointing two letters, that's a motor skill, right? So, and, and if we can't build those intentional motor pathways um, and also regulate our bodies, it's going to be a very difficult task to do. And so we, we really look and focus on intentional movement because I, I kind of explain it like intentional movement is the overarching umbrella. Spelling is one of the intentional motor tasks right. underneath it, right? But so is brushing your teeth. So is getting dressed. So is using the restroom, like all of those things. So we have to address and support the sensory motor system in order for all those other things underneath, which is life, um, to be able to be more successful. Yeah. So, I mean, it's not like you can cure it, you know, and all of a sudden, okay, now my sensory system all, all, all works, you know, how, how can you work on improving it? Uh, so that's what you do with, as an OT, I guess. So what, what kind of things do you do? Yeah. I mean, it, we all have a sensory profile, right? So even speaking myself, like I, and, and I can't just, even in Florida, just, you know, sleep under a sheet. You know, like it just, it's too light. It's like, I, I just don't feel, I like that heavy quilt, right? Yes. It just kind of helps me. Me too. I hate when I go to yeah. a hotel and they only have the thin little blanket. I'm like, no, I need my, I need the weight. Yes. Yeah. So you need to activate your proprioceptors mm -hmm. more so than somebody else who could sleep under the sheet comfortably, right? Not that I can't, it's just, I don't sleep as well. And so that then calms your body. So now you're being, reg now you're regulated in right. order to have a good solid sleep, right? So, um, so the way that we do it and really when we're just learning, you know, about our clients, um, most of them have difficulty with the spatial awareness of where is your body in space, right? And the feeling of lifting something heavy it's, it activates those proprioceptors and all of a sudden it's like, whoa, 
okay, I feel my body in space. Now I can do something more intentional with it. And, you know, going back to the medicine ball example, right? We're doing some ball slams, which I personally love because it's very stress reducing <laughs> just to slam a weighted ball down. Um, and and it's, it's moving through space intentionally, um, doing a task, getting more input, sensory input, right? And, and if you think about it, we're also triggering the vestibular system, which is, you know, our sense of balance and where we are in space. So everything... Uh, all the sensory systems overlap. It's not like I can look at vision and I can look at proprioception and I can look at tactile or touch. Everything is intertwined. Um, but we're also activating other sensory systems for our clients when we're working through these movements to help, again, the goal is to gain control of your body and build those connections. That's really the ultimate goal. Um, because if you feel that you have more body control, your anxiety and stress level is going to reduce and you're going to be more successful with what you want to do every day. Because remember, in apraxia, they understand what they want to do. They understand what the task at hand is um, or what's on demand, like go put your book in your backpack. Right. We understand that. We right. just can't get our bodies to do it. Right. So we work through, I mean, really here, we do a lot of exercise, intense exercise focused work. Um, but the way in which we do it, we do it through what's called motor coaching. So breaking down the steps of the task, right? And then coaching their bodies to do it. So we try really hard to not do the hand over hand movements, because if you think about it, right, hand over hand is all passive on their part for the most, for the most part, it's passive. And if we're talking about building connections between the brain and the body, we need to actively participate. You know, you wouldn't learn how to ride a bike if somebody was pedaling for you, right? Like you need to activate and build the connections. Um, and so we're working through the movement by coaching their body to step by step by step. And it could just be first, like get your eyes on the chair, right? Because again, we can talk about vision because that's a really big part of what we do as well, because vision directs movement, vision directs our body. And many of my clients have difficulties with not visual acuity, meaning can they see clearly? We want to make sure, of course, that that's, you know, resolved right. if there was any issues, but it's about how are they visually processing their environment and, and what they're looking at. And so if you think about our, how our eyes move, our eyes move with these tiny muscles and if we have apraxia, which is the disconnect between our brain and the muscles, right, then that's going to affect our eyes. And if you think about it, if I want to walk out the door in front of me, I'm going to go and glance at the doorknob before I reach for it. Or if I want to pick up my cup, I'm going to glance at my cup and pick it up. Well, I'm purposefully looking at that cup, right? If you don't have control of your body, that's going to be really hard. So now you can start to see, well, no wonder they can't get to the chair when I'm saying to go sit down because go sit down is the goal, but I might need to be like, get your eyes on the chair, turn your body, bring your foot forward, right? This is what I'm talking about. Right. We don't even think coaching. about all the different steps it takes just to do that because no. we do it and automatically. Most people, they would yeah. say, go sit in the chair is one step. Right. It's like, no, it's right. not. There's probably like 60 steps, you know, depending on where you are. Oh, yeah. It just makes so much sense because I would always say to people, I could say to Robbie, go throw that in the garbage and he'll just, you know, no, right. and like sometimes he would do it, mm -hmm. but most of the time he wouldn't. And that's mm -hmm. the thing that was so confusing to me. How come mm -hmm. sometimes he can and sometimes he can't? Now that I'm mm -hmm. learning about apraxia, it just, it all yeah. makes so much sense. Also what you're saying to, like my mind is going back to so many things as you're talking um talking about the site he would always do this always yes. you know closing the one eye always doing yeah. that I just yeah. thought it was a stim I didn't really know what that was all about um and when he was little when he was in early intervention they taught me about I guess it was the OTs about brushing mm -hmm. and the joint compression mm -hmm. uh those were things that I guess would calm him down you know if he was having a bad day I would do that but a lot of times he would give us his thumbs and he wanted us to squeeze his thumb mm -hmm. and he would always smile. He loved when we would squeeze his thumb and I never yeah. knew what that was about. Well, um, you said that he had neuropathy. 
we right? found out later okay. on yeah later when he was yeah. you know like 20 years old we found yeah. found out because i i took him to a physiatrist which a lot of people don't know what a physiatrist is but he yeah he, so he would do the test where you hit the knee and your leg would jump and he hit the knee and it just and it didn't jump and mm -hmm. then he put some kind of electrodes on or whatever and mm -hmm. he says yeah he doesn't sense or feel that any of this yeah. you know so with the hands and the feet yeah you know so that's why he would love those squeezes Mm. right? Because this is when, wow, now I know I have a thumb and my fingers. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I had no clue that that's that he didn't even know yep. where his hands or fingers were. Yeah. Yeah. Which neuropathy is different than proprioceptive, right? Like, mm -hmm. like when you're squeezing something, um, that's activating those proprioceptors, but, and, and I have a lot of spellers and clients that, you know, want to squeeze and they love that, like deep yeah. pressure and doing squeezes, right. but that doesn't automatically mean that they have neuropathy, right? They're, they're, right. They, and, it, but, and I'm almost thinking though, I, I, I thought it was something that developed over time. Like, I don't know mm -hmm. that he had neuropathy when he was mm -hmm. five, mm -hmm. but over time, because I mm -hmm. saw the difference in the shape of his hands changed. It was yes. very mushy in here yes. you know, and, and, and his yeah. thumb was like, became long. It was down here and he had very high arches in his feet, like, yeah. like this high, you know? So, yeah. I, yeah. I, but he didn't have that stuff when he was five, you know, yeah. it was just developed. Yeah. So I don't know. Yeah. 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 It's, it's interesting. And this is, you know, why I love what I do. Um, I love to be able to problem solve. Um, that's, I mean, why I got into OT and then here and to think, things through and I love the brain. I love neurology. You know, all my idea of a great Friday evening would be to read research papers about the brain and, you know, all this <laughs> stuff and movement. Like it's, it's sad some, but, but it's just, it, it literally like, it's my passion, you know, and right. I'm so blessed to be able to literally come to work and it doesn't feel like work. Like right. I get excited. Like it's a dopamine rush for me. Right. right. Like it's not, and I realize that not everybody is blessed to be able to have that. And, and, um, you know, of course, like everybody, there's more challenging days than, than others. And it's not always because, and this is interesting because parents will, will come in and their child will be more dysregulated or adults because, you know, we see all ages. My, my oldest was 58. And if we're talking about dysregulation, she was extremely dysregulated on her first day and parents will be like, oh, I'm so, so sorry about that. And I'm just like, no, this is, this is something that I'm learning about. I'm learning about their body. I'm learning about their sensory system. Um, I'm learning about how I can support to, them to be more regulated so that I can educate and coach you, right? Like, right. so I think that it's been in over the years of their experience with therapy is like, we're either they're doing well, or it was a tough day, right? And right. a tough day looks like, dysregulation all and i'm like no not not for me it's not um because... they talk about dysregulation a lot in the spelling uh community yeah. you know that they'll be dysregulated so explain what you mean by that exactly yeah dysregulated um looks like um you know we can't we're, we're not maintaining a calm state right now having said that i have spellers that look regulated so we're sitting Right. And then this is something that I hear a lot where parents might say to me, you know, it came out of nowhere. He just bit me, it came out of nowhere. And what I've learned from my clients specifically is it's like, oh, no, 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 no. Insides, I was feeling it. All right. Yeah. But I had no idea. And then we have the opposite of what that looks like, which you would say, you know, dysregulated. You could say aggressive, which I, do not like that word because to be aggressive implies intent, right? And if we're talking about someone who has a disconnect, meaning I don't have control over my body, um, you know, biting or, you know, hitting, grabbing, whatever, self-injurious, those kinds of things, it, it's not, it's not their intent to do that. I, I've never, because if I said, okay, now I'm holding my hand out and I'm like, okay, bite my hand. They'd be like, because it requires intent to do that, right? right. If, if it is, in fact, something that they're intentionally wanting to do, they would then be able to do it. But no, it, it's not. So I think, you know, dysregu I prefer the term dysregulated because then that's like, okay, the body isn't regulated. Um, so then what can I do? 
I tend to talk fast. I'm working on it. Um, I tend to talk, be louder. I'm working on that too. Um, but it's like, how can I bring the room down? Because not only am I supporting the regulation of my clients, but my family who is not used to having someone who understands their child, right? They go to public and, and they're like always up here because what if, what if, what if I'm also regulating the entire family at one right. time. So it's a, another, you know, whole degree that I worked on um, after in terms of looking at the dynamics, the family dynamics and looking at how can we support regulation, learning about, you know, the family and ways to support the family in that regard. So it's not just about the client or the speller or just about the sensory system or just about apraxia. It's mm -hmm. all of this, right? Sure. Um, There's a whole lot of factors. Robbie used to, he used to go after my husband a lot um, and he would, gr he'd grab him and pull him to the ground and everything. And then when, when the episode was over, he would back off and he said, and he would cry. And because, yeah. and, that, and that's how I knew he didn't want to do what just happened, right. you know, right. and it was just so right. confusing, but my yeah. husband's very loud. He's Italian. He shouts when he talks, you know, and so I could tell that that agitated him. And and I've heard stories of, of kids that they cannot be around the baby in the house because the, the pitch of the crying just sets them off. It's things in the, in the environment that are yeah. dysregulating them. I like that yeah. word. Yeah. 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 And well, but what are you going to do? You can't get rid of the baby. You know? No. <laughs> right. Right. So, so I think, you know, we're thinking about impulsive movement, right? So when we talk about purposeful or intentional movement, there's the connection between the brain and the body. When we think about impulsive, there's, there's, there's a trigger to it. And, and the trigger is either something sensory or something emotional or a combination of both. Right. And typically it's a combination of both. So, right. and they're um, very sensitive, very sensitive emotionally. And they pick up on people's, everything. not to sound new age, but they pick up on your energy. And oh, they, yeah. They, you know, and they, I mean, they're very sensitive to that. You know, Absolutely. I always say it's the sixth sense, like they yes. just pick up on you. Yes. You know? And, and so with that, you know, in mind, walking into a room of a hundred people, let's say, you know, like that, you're, they're just completely taking on all that energy, emotion, everything, right? Mm -hmm. So, so it's, that is what triggers that impulsivity is a, a sensory experience or emotion or combination. So when you think about, you know, what you just said, the example that you said with your husband, right? Mm -hmm. It could be the auditory, hundred percent. It could be the auditory, but then we also have emotion. It could be, I love dad so much, right? Because I didn't say that it was a negative emotion. I just said mm -hmm. emotion. And right. so I have spellers that will do, you know, more self-injurious, you know, um, things. And then you find out that it's because they're excited that they're going to be going wherever. And you're yeah. just like, w it doesn't Yeah, match. that doesn't and make I'm sense, like, but yeah. But that's what it is. And so in terms of like, what do you do, right? Like in a more behavioral approach, it's like, well, we need to extinguish the aggressive behavior. And mm -hmm. so we're going to you know, obviously do more of the positive like behavior. Here's what, you know, this is when you're doing really, really good with your behavior, then you're going to get, you know, a good thing. Um, and I, the way that we approach it is one to support regulation because we know it's not intentional. They're not doing it on purpose. And the reasons why they're doing it is because they're dysregulated. And so how can I support the regulation? Um, and then the next thing that we do is we work on that intentional movement because you can't be impulsive and intentional at the same time. Mm -hmm. So if we can get their brains connected to their bodies, they're going to be, they're going to have more control over their body. So then they can, you know, reduce some of those more impulsive behaviors. Okay. So that's really what, how we target it here. It's not from a behavioral approach. It's more of a, building the brain body connection approach and regulation. Yeah, that's great. All right. <clears throat> One question before we get into the spellers. Yeah. A lot of the kids love to swing. Mm -hmm. And and I see videos of people that put these swings in their house and the kids are just going around and around and around and around. How do they not get dizzy? That's <laughs> <laughs> right. That's a 
three million dollar question yeah um, I get dizzy I mean when I was a kid I you I said you I like remember. to go on a swing and I'm like I, I can't go on a swing because I get dizzy I I do like but the swing has to be in one plane because mm -hmm. and now when I was a kid I, I loved to spin but as I got older it's triggering vertigo right yeah. and that's just you know older right. lucky us but um it, it, it's something you know and and their threshold for a, that spinning is incredible right? Because the, literally they could then get off the swing and walk in a straight line and go to the door. And you're like, what? like, I'm looking at you feeling like I'm yeah. going to vomit. It's, it's really there. We all have a threshold for certain sensory input, right? So for example, my threshold for spinning is like none versus right. what they, but they they actually don't feel regulated until they hit that threshold. So they're going to do other things. The thing with like trampoline, swing, um, again, great things to give input. A trampoline is proprioceptive input. The yeah. swing is vestibular input, but it's not intentional movement, right? So building that connection, just like Ido said, that was all fun and important for my sensory system, mm -hmm. which it is. But when we're talking about apraxia and building that connection, there isn't intention behind that. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? So Again, it's it's something that their specific sensory information or, or um, it's their sensory input they need, but I'm also going to then implement vestibular-based activities to address that into more intentional movement work. So if I was working with that. So to answer your question, why? It's, it's really just their threshold for that, and it's common, super common. But then the other side of that is I have those, uh, I just saw one this past week where I had a client come in and just anything with her feet off the ground, it was like death grip on you, will not. And there's that's where you bring in the visual component too, because our vestibular system is the you know fluid in her inner ear and when it's dispersed, when our head moves, right? It rates us. So if we're falling over, we know that we have to get up because that fluid is is shifted but it also is with our peripheral vision. And so when, um, if, you're, if your vision is off and there's, you know, like I said, we can go down that road at some point, but then that is going to affect your sense of balance. Like if you think about vertigo, if you've ever had it, right? That's a visual thing, but it's also triggered with your inner ear because of the crystals being dispersed. Everything is spinning and that's what you're seeing. Your eyes are spinning and you do not have balance. So that's what can be triggered for some of our spellers with vision differences. And again, this is an acuity. It's completely different. Um, and, you know, not feeling grounded. And it was like incredible for her. She just like, it was just this literally a death grip. Like I was like, okay, like sitting in a chair without feeling grounded with her feet. Yeah. It, she was not doing it. She couldn't do it. Couldn't do it. Yeah, because so, Robbie, when he went down the steps, he would go one step at a time. He'd go boom, 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 yeah. boom, you know, yeah. and, and I knew that he he felt his balance was off. Yeah. By doing and that. that was probably a lot to do with the vision, too, because of the depth. A lot of my clients' depth perception. Right, the depth perception. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And then, but also when he got older, he got re really picky about his shoes and he always wanted to wear like these hiking boots. Mm -hmm. Like he wouldn't wear like the sneakers he wanted. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I'm like, it's summertime. It's too hot. <laughs> I'm like... Hide the hiking boots, yep. like make sure he put yep. sandals on him, something, but he like insisted on that. Um, but that was at the time he probably was getting, he, he, he was developing the neuropathy too. But, but all these things tell me he should oh, yeah. get an OT. <laughs> well, I mean, it, it, it they it's... take out the OT, you know, and when he went to a school for autistic kids, mm -hmm. he had OT when he had early intervention, but then when they put him in school, they said, oh no, he doesn't need it. Well, here's the thing. Here's the thing, though, Cindy, is what I hear, because that hot like I hear that day in and day out, like when I have mm -hmm. families, right? Like, oh, what can I get my OT to do? Or he doesn't mm -hmm. get OT in, or school and they're working on handwriting, right? Like, right. so it, it, one school OT is like, they, it has to, you know, be about academics, which, okay, I get. So essentially, if you can hold a spoon or hold a pencil, you're good to go, right? right? And then even OT, so what I know now and what I've learned from my spellers plus other experts out there about movement, about autism, about apraxia, I did not learn in OT school. Mm -hmm. So when I have OTs that are coming to me and are like, oh, yeah, or potential OTs, right? Like, I, I right. want to go to OT school and do what you do. I'm like, save your money. Yeah. <laughs> don't you're not gonna don't do it. It. unless Unless you're wanting to go and work with geriatrics or you want to, you know, something like that, which absolutely, right. but like, 
if you want to do what I do, it's like, here's, here's my library of, of books that this is, and here are the, the spellers that you need to go and talk to, because this is how you're going to learn what I do. Right. Yeah. Okay. Perfect seg segue. Let's talk about right. spellers. So yeah. how did you, how, how did you get into that? For, how do you get, go from OT now to spellers and, and having a, a, a spelling center and everything? Right. So I, I had at the time, 2015, I was also starting a school um, because I must have been bored and I needed something. And no, it really, truly, it was because it was a need here um, in Florida and, you know, school supports, I'm sure like other states um, for those with disabilities is, is not good. And so I had parents that um, came to me and were like, oh, if we could only have a school like and do what you do here at the clinic and school plus academics and this kind of thing. And this was, this was actually before spelling, right? So then I was still thinking like I was taught in school that those with autism, the main thing they need is sensory integration and they have an intellectual disability because that's what we were taught. That's what we were taught. Um, and so I then had a mentor um, to help me with school and developing a school that um, because she had um, also built a school and she was the one that introduced me to spelling and she sent me a video and she was like, you have to see this. And I was like looking at it and I of course looked it up and this is what I do is I research things. And I was like, all I ca all that came up was like negatives about spelling, right? So I'm like, what are you talking? Like, do you not see this? And then she's like, Dana, think about this from the motor perspective. And as soon as she, it was like, I, I just did a 180, right? Cause it made sense to me as an OT, it's a motor skill, right? But I, I was still caught up in the cognitive part of it. Like, right. yeah, but they can't spell. Like, what are you talking about? And so um, that's what really got me. And then um, at that time, so there was Soma and RPM, right? And, and it's so interesting how life works because I, to this day, remember when I was 13 years old, sitting on my sofa, my parents would watch 60 Minutes periodically. Ah. And that particular, that particular night, Sunday night, they had it on and I re exactly remember where I was watching this Indian woman with her son and I was sitting there like, what? And I just didn't put two and two together until I looked it up and went RPM and I'm like, oh my goodness, Shelly, this is the woman. Like I was like, it was like all connecting. And so um, that's that she, she had hosted Soma up in Atlanta. And so this is kind of where I was getting all this information. So then at that point in time, um, there was RPM and then- Wait a minute, you were yep. watching Soma on 60 Minutes when you were 13? When I was 13. Or... So that was, yeah, 13. And then um, Shelly introduced me to RPM. So it all came back. So I was you like, remembered oh. the episode that you watched when you were 13. Got yes. it. Okay. Because at, at 13, it I It didn't like, come oh, on again because I no. can't find that episode. You can't no. find it anywhere. Yeah. No, no, it didn't. It was just like in my memory. I was like, yes. this is the woman. I remember okay. this, right? You remembered that episode. Yeah. It, yeah. And it had an impact on me in some way. And then now, you know, it's like I said, interesting how life works. Um, right. And so then at that point, um, she, Shelly had connections with Elizabeth Bossler who had created or was starting Spelling to Communicate, right? So then she was like, this is, she's going to be starting a training, um, you need to come. And this is back in 2015. This, this was nine years ago. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And so I was in the first cohort because at that point, Elizabeth Vosser was just kind of putting it, her training all together. So again, you know, Soma creating RPM for the purposes of like showing everyone that her son Tito could learn, right? Has, here's the academics. He could do this. That was really the, the goal was more academic focused. And right. then Elizabeth being an SLP was like, okay, this can be communication. And so um, I went and attended the very first cohort for Spelling to Communicate with, um, it was in Atlanta. A lot of the community was there, the spelling community that's currently still there. Um, and so then I came back here to Tampa and I was like, okay, I guess I got to start this. I guess I got to just keep going. I was the only one here. And at that point the school was going. So I literally shifted my paradigm, right? Because at first it was like, okay, we're going to do these like academics, play-based everything, which is still good for the littles. But then the older ones, I was like, we're getting academics here because I'm presuming competence. Um, and then we started to implement spelling. So I went on and was fully trained. 
um, and then, you know, really took a, a part of the um, training, like, because we were trained and then we were mentors through for other providers and we continued on. Um, and that's when then Elizabeth Foster started the International Association for Spelling as Communication, or IASC, and invited a number of us to um, be on that leadership cadre. So that's then when I was reintroduced to Don Marie Gavin. So that's how kind of these worlds are coming together. I had met Don Marie actually at an education conference because she was also wanting to start a school in California. That didn't pan out, but we then ended up, I, you know, created and, and started the school here. And then she and I got together when we were introduced to Spelling to Communicate and that whole thing. So then we were both um, providers, practitioners, and um, we were part of the training. We had probably at that time, like, and still do the largest uh, clinics, spelling clinics. And then she called me, it was the pandemic hit. And, you know, everything went upside down. People were doing Zoom. She called me and she was like, okay, so we need to somehow figure out how we can get more families exposed to spelling. Because that was when Underestimated was just coming out, the book, Underestimated. And... And I was oblivious to, I was, she was like, oh, Dana, we got to get our clinic set up for this. We got it. And I'm like, I'll probably get five people. Right. It, it was like this, it, I was inundated with people, which at that, that was great for the whole spelling community and families. So that's when we, she called me and she was, was like, after the okay, book, just after the book. Okay. Yeah. And then she called me and she was like, do you want to do like a camp, you know, like a week long camp? where we could have a number of families. And so I was like, sure, yes, let's do it. So that's how it started. And then here we are. Where, so where did the, you do the camp? So the camp, the first one we did here in Tampa, mm -hmm. and that's what's, that's our immersion program. So you may see that on Facebook where people are asking, when's the next immersion program? When's the immersion week? Um, so it's a, a five day intensive for families to come and we've increased the number because of the demand, which has been awesome. So we typically have 21 families that come and they get um, seminar, uh, parents have seminars, they have spelling sessions, they have intentional movement sessions. Um, they have time together with the families. We do fun stuff as a large group. Um, so it's, it's, it's like when you went to camp as a kid and you're like, you know, you build those friendships and then you stay connected and yeah. then, you know, sometimes it, but the goal was to support parents because we knew, I mean, parents are the ones that are going to be taking this, right? Like they're the ones that have to learn this because they're going to be their child's number one communication partner. And so we knew that, and we knew that our clinics were getting busy and we were having waiting lists and we didn't want that. That's why we created the immersion week. So then parents could go on and take and practice with their kids and then come back periodically or to get support as needed if they didn't have a provider right. that was local. Right. It's really important. The parents have to learn also because you can't just depend on you to come in once a week or whatever. Um, you know, it's, you yeah. have to, they need to communicate every day. Yeah. Well, and I think that's the biggest, like for, for me as an OT, right. The, the traditional therapy is like the method, right. As you come once a week, and then, you know, the therapy that your child works with a the therapist and then, you know, the child or the therapist will be like, okay, so at home this week, practice this and this, and then I'll see you next week, which those are, I mean, we still do that here. I have um, providers that see clients once a week, but the difference is, is that the majority of the session is coaching parents. It's right. not working with the provider. And then when I have families, so I see families that come in for intensives. So they come in for two days. Um, I just, I see all the families that come from out of town and literally I work with the speller the first session and even get the parents on the first session. But then the rest of the sessions are all parent coaching. Hmm. Yeah. Cause they have to leave feeling very confident and competent to be able to do this at home and practice. Right. Um, because it's like riding a bike right? You have to work on that motor skill. And if you want to become an Olympian or a concert pianist, it doesn't happen by practicing once a week. Right. It's got to be. Exactly. Right. Exactly. I always laugh at that because I took piano lessons and I didn't practice. <laughs> same, same. I was finally allowed to quit after my mom was like, all right, you're not going to do this. Okay. 
right. supposed to be the well-roundedness, right, right, of an individual. Yeah, yeah. Right. Um, so if a parent is brand new to this mm -hmm. and they want to learn about this, what do they do? They they contact you, like, is there a waiting time? Like, do are you backed up? I am um, a couple of months for me. Now uh, we have other providers here yeah. and same thing in San Diego. So just to kind of um, make sure everything is clear in terms of where I am, where Don Marie is. So right. I have Speller Center Tampa here. Right. Don Marie has Speller Center San Diego. Right. Um, next week actually we'll be announcing this um, next week. So it's fine to say here is that we're going to be opening a Speller Center Charleston South Carolina. And then in early 2025, first quarter, we'll be opening Speller Center Atlanta. So those ones will be run by our providers and right. us. Um, and so, yeah, when, when Don Marie and I created Speller's and then, you know, the method being Speller's method, right? So there's Speller's, the organization, and then the actual method right. is that we wanted to make sure that when families came, they would get like it's it's holistic. I mean, what I mean by that is that they're understanding the motor, they're understanding the vision component and its, you know, impact on spelling. And we have a very well-trained developmental optometrist in the, our method, but then ob obviously using their expertise to be able to assess. So often I'll have families that will come, that will come and see me um, for spelling and or motor, because I'll obviously do the intentional motor. I have two other OTs that are trained in intentional motor. Um, and then they'll also come for developmental optometry evaluation, because that's what we're talking about with its holistic. Yes, it's about spelling and yes, it's about communication. But until we really have that strong foundation understanding of what the speller's sensory motor or neuromotor profile is, it, you know, we it, spelling could be very difficult. And we, the, our biggest thing is we want success. We want parents to be able to understand their child better um, in terms of how to regulate so that they're able to get the motor skills to be able to spell. So for us, for both Domery and I at Speller Centers, any Speller Center that you would go to, it is something that it's much more than just spelling because you'll, as far as what you'll learn. Right, right. So this is something that sort of evolved out of S2C. It's like now now you guys are, are expanding and you're adding these other components, right? The OT exactly. and, the bit and the vision and all that. Yeah. So once they do come, so, do mm -hmm. they come so they come for like a two day intensive? Like mm -hmm. that's how it begins. But that's yes. that, that you mentioned. And then so you work with the with with the client first and then the and then the next day you start working with the parent. Right. Yes, and correct. then what, then do they keep coming every week or mm -hmm. do they like, what if somebody lives in Minnesota and they want to fly down to Florida to, to do this? Right. I mean, like, so we, we mentioned underestimated, right? So, mm -hmm. so JB Hanley that, that wrote it lives in California, but he flew all mm -hmm. the way to Virginia for, mm -hmm. you know, a couple of days and then he went home. Right. Yep. So yep. I want people to, that are watching this, that live all over the country to understand what the, what the process is. Yeah. So because this is really at Spellers, we really believe this is a parent driven program, right? Parents need to be invested and understand that it is going to be about the practice that they're working on. So they come, I, when they leave here, they have very specific, um, you know, lists or tasks in order to do and how to practice. And they know the process of what to do in a spelling session. They have all the skills that they need at that time. They have all the equipment, you know, letter boards, lessons, all those things. Um, any accommodations that we might make based on what their speller's um, profile is, they would know all of that. And, you know, we recommend 15, 20 minutes of practice on a daily basis. We also understand that life happens, so that's not always going to happen. But then they typically will come back. Usually it's every two to three months if that's something that they're able to do. But if not, we offer um, Spellers, the organization at any clinic, offers mm -hmm. Zoom sessions that we can help. We also have um, our communication CP communication partner course that we offer. It's an eight week course on our website where when you're in an intensive, it's four sessions. Like you said, we have two sessions one day, two sessions the other day. The goal is understanding and getting spelling going. We don't always have time to kind of go over all of the other, 
theory, you know, in terms of why do we sit this way? Why do we do this? Why are lessons built this way? All of those things. And so mm -hmm. in our CP course, that goes through during the seminars, um, parents can get a better understanding of the actual method. And then they also are paired with a mentor that they can submit up to seven videos to get feedback on. So that kind of takes them from the intensive and then they're able to kind of get more support through that. Um, some don't do that. Some, you know, go home and practice. We offer those CP course every eight weeks. So it just, you know, continuously goes. Um, and then of course we have our handbook where that also has been something that's really helpful for parents to, again, we don't teach how to do it in the handbook. We talk about it in the handbook and what it is. And it's a really great thing to prep parents before they come to uh, an intensive so they know what to expect because sometimes it's like, can, can, do you think my child can do it? Like, can they do it? Like, uh, right. Mm -hmm. um, and so it, it's a good prep prior to coming to an intensive. Um, so we mentioned the, the, the book underestimated mm -hmm. the, how do we get to the movie? Right. So the movie, so the book got you, do yeah. you all of a sudden your business exploded from the book. What? Yeah. <laughs> right. Then now let's add a movie right. to the picture. Right. Right. So, and that was something where JB and Jamie, you know, they had a friend who, uh, was a producer and um, was like, okay, let's make this into a documentary and get it out there even more to mm -hmm. those families. And so that was, so that started, it, it was about two and a half years that it took to do that. And it, it you know, it was a lot. Like I think for Damari and she can obviously speak more to her experience yeah. because it was really shot predominantly at her clinic and, yeah. and it was like okay so let's you know have a couple weeks of shooting and it ended up being two and a half years um and so then I was I was brought in um to talk more because again the whole apraxia piece is something that isn't known and so for individuals to understand number one we have to presume competence which you know people can can get when they understand what does presuming competence mean it doesn't mean they know everything it means that they can learn right mm -hmm. um and then understanding apraxia has to happen too because you have to understand that autism is a neuromotor disability those with non-speaking autism it's neuromotor right mm -hmm. um and so and and unreliable speakers too the, and of course they're speaking autistics, which they wouldn't need the support, but it's, it's something that has to be out there. So that's when we, then I was brought in and part of it, and then it continued on, it continued on, it continued on. Um, and then, yes. So that was an amazing experience. It really was to be able to, to have those, the cast members, all of them be a part of something that they could advocate and, and really get it out there. And they, I mean, going to the Phoenix Film Festival was such a big party for all of them. And, and for us just to see how they had transformed. Like when I look at, when I say transformed, I'm like, now they're all adults. And when right. I saw at the beginning, it was like, they look so young. It's just, it's really awesome for me to see spellers and more and more and more spellers and what they're doing and their successes, graduating from high school, going to college, you know, living their dreams because they're able to communicate, which is a basic human right. 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 Yeah. yeah. So, so that's when, yeah, the film um, or the documentary, and then we had it where it was, um, it was, it, we were able to raise money for Spellers Freedom Foundation, um, which that's a, well, that was a foundation set up by Jamie and his family so that um, others who weren't able to access resources for spelling and to be able to get started, that's what they wanted was they just want every single non-speaker to be able to have access. Oh, so that's okay, where- Yeah, yeah the, I didn't know that existed. That's great. Yeah, because yeah, not everybody could yeah. afford it. This is not something that's covered exactly. under insurance. Right, you know? right, right, right. But it goes back to, you know, when you actually, if you want to kind of compare like OT, ABA, traditional therapies that you would get in comparison to coming to a provider. And then again, with the goal, this is what we do. The goal is to get the parents going, right? right. So it's not that you have to come every week. Like, right. so the comparison of actual money spent is quite a bit less, even though up front, it might be a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Um and so then, so yes, so Speller's Freedom Foundation, um, the, the film is owned by Speller's Freedom Foundation. So that's where 
they, the board, which predominantly are spellers on that board, they make the decision. And so huh. for them, the decision was, right? Yeah. They decided that they wanted to get it out there to as many people as possible. And so of course, YouTube is going to do that. Sure. And so after for Autism Awareness Month this past April, um, we released it on YouTube. So yes. that's there. And then from the, the movie, um, Pat, who's the director, Pat Nataro, he approached Omri and I and was like, okay, so what if we took each of the characters or characters, the cast members, because, you know, you only learned a little bit about each of the cast members. Right. What if we took each of those cast members and did a series, a TV series? So we were like, let's do it get more people on boards, get more people spelling. And of course the cast members were like, yes, this yeah. is awesome. Yeah. So mm -hmm. we were able to produce five episodes that um, are now out there. They were released over the last uh, like June um, through the month of June. And so they're up on underestimated.tv and you can see them. They are, you, you are paying for the series. And again, that goes to potentially building more series um, and episodes, which that would be exciting. Right. Um, so yeah, so that's kind of where we're at. We finished that. We're just kind of taking a break from the whole TV camera thing because it's fun, but yeah. then yeah, it's but like, okay, let's go to work. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Did you have to go to California for that? Yes, I did. Which, um, which you know, takes for... time, time away from your clinic. It, totally. Right? Yeah. The, the clinic and, um, you know, here supporting my people. Thankfully, I have a solid uh, team here in Tampa and, you know, never worried about that. But yeah, I mean, now it's, it's, it's not fun to travel as much as it used to be with delays and all. So yeah, it's just time and time and time. But, you know, for the end goal, the end goal is getting spelling out there. That's, that's what right. we've always wanted right. is to produce that. Right. Yeah. Which is what I'm trying to do here with my, my little podcast. I'm trying to get word out as much as I can. Yeah. Um, okay. So contact information, tell us the name of your clinic, clinic, uh, the, the website, if people want to look you up, how do they find you? So spellers.com, super simple, super easy. Um, you will find all of our programs on their information. Um, I'm speller center, Tampa. Don Maria Speller Center San Diego. You'll find all the information on spellers.com though. So it's kind of like a one-stop shop there. Perfect. Um, and you can fill out the contact form. Our admin will get it. We'll get you going. We'll do consults. They do live Zoom consults. So parents can have a whole bunch of time to ask questions. Um, and then we schedule time depending on which clinic you want to go to. And it, like I said, soon there'll be Charleston and Atlanta as well as options. Great. And hopefully we'll get New Jersey in there eventually. Yeah. I mean, East Coast, right? I'm a little biased. So we're all kind of, but yeah, go, let's if, work up and down the East Coast. Right. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Don Marie's like, wait. And I'm like, you're good. You're good. Yeah. 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 <laughs> All right, Dana, thank you so much for being with us today. I learned a lot from you and uh, hopefully we'll keep getting the word out and we'll, we'll add more and more spellers out there. We'll get them spelling. Thanks so much, Cindy. It's been really great to sit and chat for a little bit and I love your mission. I love this platform and I'm excited too for all the new spellers and their families. Yay. <laughs> That's it for today's episode. I hope you enjoyed listening and it helped you gain a new perspective. To learn more about our children's book series, Robbie's World and His Spectrum of Adventures, or to learn more about what we do at Robbie's World Foundation, simply visit our website at robbiesworldbook.com. Thank you for joining us today. Be sure to join us again on our next episode of Spectrum Perspectives.